Hey guys, Devin Martin here, and today's video is about the not self strategies in human design explained. So, I want to take this opportunity to go a little bit deeper into what these strategies mean on a practical and holistic level, and I want to tie in some research that I've done when it comes to um, just the human experience, the brain, trauma, traumatic stress response childhood pattern healing and all that fun stuff. So I want to bring in other elements so that we can talk about this topic and explain it in a way that it lands for you and that also you can start healing with what these things are telling you about your human design chart. So first I want to just, you know, paint a picture of like what the not self strategies are and where they come from and then go a bit deeper into what that means for you and your chart, how to find them, that kind of thing, and also how to work with it and to identify these patterns in your life so that you can take away some practical healing tools um, in your life because you know we can learn a lot about ourselves through different systems and through human design, but the real work and the real integration is actually taking this knowledge or taking these ideas, concepts, and theories and then implementing them in a way in our life where there's actually great change. So I've made other videos about these topics. Make sure to check out the description and I'll link other helpful videos for you along with anything that's upcoming uh, that you may be interested in and also how to contact me or to work with me one-on-one -on -one with this work. So that being said, where does the not self strategies come from? So in human design, I'd recommend going on mybodygraph.com, um, which will give you a really simple interactive tool to click around on the body graph and your human design body graph, and it will tell you what the centers are, and it will also list your not self strategies. But I want to really open and expand this in a way that um, we're going to just talk about the collective human experience and what it means so that you can relate it to your own. So there's nine centers in the body graph and some of them are gonna be colored in, which makes up all the core foundation of your human design chart, which makes up your type, which comes with a strategy to experiment with, inner authority, which is the place to consistently trust for decision-making in human design, um, and it comes with all sorts of things, like your chemistry, your strengths, you know, all that good stuff. And then there's centers that are white, which are considered undefined, which are more flexible and open to conditioning of the environment for good or bad. So we take in these patterns, we absorb things through our openness, anything that's white in your chart, whether that's a center or a gate, and we receive that conditioning, it becomes pattern in our own body sponge, in our energetic sponge. So this can be good conditioning as a nurturing, where we learn from others uh, that we need, where we need to be supported, and it can also be negative conditioning in the sense where it's old, outdated patterns, or we're still running on it based off things that aren't really serving us anymore, or aren't really helping us in our lives. So in human design, when we're looking at this polarity, the this and that, what's colored in and what's consistent for you is considered the true self. It's considered a pathway of selfish enlightenment to implement these strategies to come home to yourself, to trust yourself, to trust the energy that's consistent, to exercise that energy, to be empowered in that energy, to love yourself in who you are. And then anything that's open or white in your chart will come with a not self strategy. So in human design terms, you can think of not self. Well, what the hell does that mean? The quickest translation is not self, meaning it's not you. It's some kind of pattern um, or some kind of way of coping with our reality in our life that is going to pull you away from these core things, you know, of trusting ourselves in human design. Now, sometimes when we see the not self strategies, there's a lot of different reactions. And I think the pathway of going into the shadow work around it is really the path of liberating ourselves out of it by really like confronting the truth of that, like confronting and seeing these patterns in our lives. But a lot of people have different reactions to the not self strategy and it can sound kind of strange but like, let's open it up to a, like a more open, expanded view of this. We can look at it in psychology as like coping mechanisms, right? So if we go through a stressful experience or we go through a traumatic event, the brain is so brilliant 
that it actually creates survival strategies to cope with our reality. And basically, all of these areas in our lives that are called not self strategies in human design, the way that human design approaches the healing with this is quite simple, but it can also seem a bit archaic because the mind wants to understand it on deep, deeper levels, and that's why I'm here. Um, because I dissect this stuff down to the core, experiment, use myself as a guinea pig in my life and my own healing, and then I am here to share that wisdom and experience with you guys. So, in human design, what you will be told is that follow your strategy and authority and then and don't listen to the not self and then that will go away. And yeah, there's actually some truth to that in the sense if you stay with the rigorous process of self-trust. Now human design will kind of pinpoint some areas to trust, whether that's yourself, it could be your instincts, your gut response, your emotional clarity, and so on, right? So there's these simple, practical, mechanical, biological tools in the body of going like, hey, let's trust this place. But I'm gonna put that on its head for a second and say that it doesn't matter necessarily when it comes to these coping mechanisms, what you particularly have defined in your chart and what you have open. Because when it comes to the human experience, stress or traumatic events, what can happen is that we experience the not self strategy of all nine centers. So it's important to understand these not self strategies in our human experience because you know, even if we have a center defined, it doesn't mean that we still don't feel the shadow, we feel the pain, or we feel the, the intense old pattern of coping with our reality through that center. It doesn't take away from that, it's just the openness or the white in your chart when you're looking at your body graph is going to probably take up the attention first because it's so much more sensitive and it's so much more amplified to outside conditioning. So that those open centers, when we're growing up, for example, with our family, we're taking in that energy. And what happens is the mind will create strategies to survive. So what is a not self strategy? A not self strategy is the innocence of our human development to survive. It's an innocent strategy we take on to survive and to cope with that situation or reality, which later in life can tend to be a lingering pattern that we take with us regardless if that situation is actually happening or not. So that's why we may feel triggered in certain situations around certain people because they trigger an old situation and our old patterning, our old not self strategies, our old traumatic, resp uh, traumatic response stresses come up and we think it's the same situation. And most of the time those triggers come in so that we can actually heal and break those patterns or understand where they came from or understand that we actually have another place to trust other than the amplification and the stress that our body is feeling. So all of these strategies actually aren't inherently bad. And sometimes when we see these strategies in our chart, we can have a funny reaction to them. The one can be, <clears throat> oh shit, I do that. Or the other one can be complete denial and diso dissociation, like, oh no, I don't do that strategy, until it keeps coming into our face, or until we are vulnerable enough to truly see the pattern, to truly see the pattern. Now these patterns are simple enough in human design and they span across humanity. So for example, if you experience one of these things, like, like you don't feel good enough, um, so you try to overprove yourself, is one of them, um, it's not just you, okay? There's nothing wrong with you. That's actually a collective coping mechanism to survive and cope in this world and reality. So every struggle or everything that you have struggled with, with these kind of negative self-talk, for example, isn't inherently bad, but it's our responsibility as adults to look at it and go, wow, well, why, did, why do I feel this way? And is it actually true? And what I'll say to you is that all these um, strategies, they are true in the sense where it is a very real thing for the body to learn to survive, that we're wired for it. So yes, it is real and maybe at one point you needed it. And there's wisdom in still using these not self strategies in some cases, and that's where the wisdom is. But, so, let's go back a little bit. So these areas, 
They're not inherently bad. But as we evolve, we have to actually break through or bypass some of these strategies so that we can grow and move forward in our lives. So there's going to be nine major themes, and through those nine major themes and centers, there's 64 gates or 64 gene keys that all carry shadows. Now, what's really cool about being in this lifetime right now and having access to this information is we can actually be artful about it. We can actually look at it, own it, and work through it with a new language of life using human design and the gene keys. We can look at it and not beat ourselves up for behaving that way or not beating ourselves up for our mind and our body trying to protect ourselves or trying to live in this world. Instead of beating ourselves up or feeling like we're doing something wrong, no, we can say, Everything that I am experiencing, every symptom, every negative self pattern is a direct effect and a direct symptom of something that I've experienced in my life and has caused some kind of stress or some kind of strategy to cope with that. Now, so have compassion for yourself when you start to look at these listed non self strategies, for example. And there's some major, there's some big ones that kind of plague humanity on a bigger level, but I want to let you know that any of these things you feel, you're not alone. And by having compassion for yourself, you're going to have more compassion for other people when you see them acting these things out. Because we can be very quick to judge like, oh, why does that person just keep avoiding the truth with me and like kind of lying? Why does that person keep avoiding me when things get tough? Why does that person feel like they're constantly proving themselves and under stress and overcompensating for everything and, and draining themselves, right? And we can be easy to beat this up, you know, like, oh, they should know better, right? But hey, how do we know better when we don't actually look at this stuff? How do we know better if we don't go through it? How do we know better if we don't even know where it came from in the first place? How do we know better when we didn't even know they were there because they've just been unconsciously running the show for decades or our lifetime, right? So somewhere along the line, when you see these things come up, there was probably an experience or many that kicked the body into gear enough for it to behave that way to continue moving forward with life. Now, once we get older, some of these not self strategies tend to plague our reality because we realize, oh shit, why can't I let go of things that are bad for me? I know it's bad for me, but for some reason I can't let go. That's the spleen. So it's like when we look at these things and we own them, we can take them as a little bit of a meditation practice and work their way into our consciousness by being gentle about these not self strategies and looking at it in a sense where they came from childhood. So that innocent, pure, open-hearted little child that you were learned somewhere in some situation through your development that these strategies were going to protect you. And until one day as an adult, you realize, hey, this isn't protecting me anymore, but it's actually hurting me, right? Then we can look at it with compassion. So they come from reactions to stressful, overwhelming, or traumatic events, which is completely natural. They also come from trying to cope and survive, which is completely natural. They also come from self-protection and self-preservation as we learn to navigate in this reality, right? So it is all completely natural. Anything you could think was wrong with you was some kind of natural coping mechanism that somewhere along the line you learned. And a lot of times it's very real. It's extremely real. So human design is just one window into looking at these strategies and how they connect biologically in the body. So I want to overview them a little bit in this so you get a touch of kind of what this stuff looks like. So for me, in the beginning of my human design journey, I recognized that the amplification of my seven open centers were just screaming at me with these strategies, just screaming at me. And in my sensitivity, I didn't really realize how much they were like running and undercutting the show until I was like sitting at a silent retreat in my discomfort and hearing all these voices screaming at me. Uh, there's another video about that. I'll link it in this one. Um, but essentially like 
what Ra Urahu said was that each one of these centers actually has a voice and it has a voice in the mind and then the mind will take over and try to run the show. And then human design is basically saying the way that we kind of outwit these shadows is by coming back to the body, trusting the body over that stuff that's screaming at us, okay? Now that's one way of doing it. Um, and it's worked tremendously for me in a lot of ways when I recognize it, but I think it's a multi-layered process of healing and these patterns take time to break guys. So it's not like, okay, so I have an open spleen and that can be not wanting to let go of things that aren't good for us because it still feels good just by first thinking about that doesn't mean that now everything that's bad for you, you're going to let go of because you know that. And I mean, hopefully it could create a, a catalyst in your life. Great. But it's a layer by layer process. So deep ingrained patterns and fears, you know, it's like experiences will just keep coming into our lives to look at it at a different level to then be able to let it go or make a decision in the opposition of that. Right. So for example, if we start with the open spleen, the open spleen wants to feel safe. The open spleen wants to feel good. Um, and the open spleen has a really hard time letting go of defined spleens or things that give it that feel good, right? So that could be substances, food, especially relationships um, and things like that. So for example, you know, um, say you're in a relationship with somebody and at some core intuitive level you know that it's actually not healthy for you to be in a relationship with them but you're overwhelmed by the sometimes feel good or the safety or false safety that that person is um, providing in some way but it's very hard to discern if the open spleen is scared and doesn't want to let go of that resource even if your true self, your higher power, your gut, your intuition, your heart, whatever it is, is actually telling you otherwise, that that thing is actually not healthy and it needs to be let go of, right? So once we make these pivotal choices with trusting ourselves versus holding on to an old toxic passion, uh, passion pattern, passion or pattern, um, change happens. And at the same time, wherever you're open or have these not self strategies are a source of wisdom. So over time, open spleens, for example, will learn when it's healthy to let go of things or not. So for example, maybe there's a pattern that you know really isn't the best, right? But it's actually not healthy for you to let go of it at that time because it gives you some sense of stability or routine and your body just isn't ready to let go at this point, even if you're aware, it might not be the best thing ever, okay? So for example, um, I went through a period of my life of great detox and I let go of so many things and a boyfriend at the time told me I should stop drinking coffee because it wasn't the best for me and I said, with that wisdom, I've let go of a lot. <clears throat> I'm not letting go of my coffee right now, even if it's not the best thing ever for me, because I know that right now, I'm not ready to let go of that, right? So <clears throat> this is a process of awareness through these patterns, through these patterns. So just to highlight some of the other centers, the open root, and guys, if you have these centers defined, like if you have a defined spleen, it doesn't mean that you don't have a hard time letting go. These are collective strategies, right? It just can feel sometimes way more intense when it's open because it's really, the sponge is really held with these old patterns and there can be just a heightened sensitivity in those areas. <clears throat> so we have the root, which is pressurized and that root can push us quickly into doing things too quickly even when it's not aligned with self or blah, 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 because the pressure can be so blinding. So it can just push us into go, go, go. It can push us into doing things way too quickly. When we move up to the sacral, when it's open or inconsistent, there's inconsistent energy to work. When that gets amplified, then all of a sudden, we don't know when to stop working. We don't know how to have boundaries with our energy and our work because it's amplified and that strategy to overcompensate for that is to keep working. Not knowing when to stop, not knowing when to say enough enough is enough. Even when you're tired, even when you're burnt out, even when you're about to pass out, even if you're sick and you still show up. Open emotional. 
Open emotional can be scared of emotional people. And what it learns is to not avoid confrontation and truth. It wants to avoid the difficult stuff because it's too hard when the boat is rocked. It fears emotional backlash and the intensity of other people. So what it does is it can go from the extreme of just living a totally, uh, you know, hidden life because it doesn't, it's just not safe to confront certain truths or confront certain realities. It may have learned that by confronting emotional truths that it wasn't safe. So it learns not to, it learns to avoid to the point where it's actually unhealthy. The wisdom is confronting it when needed and knowing when it's not safe to confront something and to walk away. When we go up to the ego center, it's all about self-esteem. And somewhere along the line, we learned that we had to prove ourselves. We, had to, we learned that we needed to overcompensate to show how good we are at something whether that's our work or you know our role in our family or whatever the hell it is, we learn to overcompensate, which can leave us overextended, burnt out, and can put a lot of stress on the heart muscle. Now, you know, the wisdom is realizing that you don't have anything to prove and becomes more careful about what it commits to. And it takes its time to make sure it can actually really commit to something before it completely burns out your energy and you overcompensate for it and leave yourself drained. Now, the G-Center, the sense of self and identity, it's, it, it can be this disorientation of constantly searching for things outside of self to, to hold on to and to be constantly looking for which way to go to identify or which role to be in to identify with that or can constantly be looking for love and direction. Constantly looking for love and direction and something to identify with, whether it's a person or it's a job. Now, the open throat is constantly looking for attention so it has that energy to manifest and to put their energy into form. So it can be kind of this funny thing of having a, sh a sh uh, throat that's shut down or a throat that's super amplified and there can be this inconsistentness with the way that the voice is used. And so we wait and recognize that, you know, these things will come, you know? Now the head and the ajna are t kind of tricky ones, you know? they really the head really pressures us to think about things that don't matter and to answer everybody's questions and the ajna just wants to be certain and can pretend it's certain and search and search and search until it's certain now the funny thing with all these open centers is that once we realize the negative coping mechanisms that aren't serving us anymore we can actually begin to have fun with them and these areas can not only become our biggest source of flexibility wisdom, and even genius is actually here to be where we're wise about how we deal with the material world and even where we learn to make the most money. So in the beginning of these not-self strategies, we see that it can plague our lives with old patterns. And once we confront these things and recognize and own them in ourselves, these shadows, then we can have fun with it. So now, all these years later of experimenting with it, I love my open centers. I love having an open mind. I love the openness and the flexibility of that sensitivity in these areas. And I still break these old kind of underlying patterns. So it's almost as if these sponges that we have in our openness, they're full and we start to break away thing by thing. And then we start to get to the core, you know, the core of the pattern. And, you know, this is all an experiment, guys. So I hope that this exploration of the not-self strategies explained on a deeper level both highlighted some things that not only you may experience, but on a collective global level. This is the human story. This is our human shadow experience, which is innocently formed in childhood to protect and dissociate from self to live. And human design is just one tool, and the gene keys is another, to get back there somehow. And it all starts with trusting yourself, regardless of what these strategies are screaming at you in situations. So, whether or not you go down these systems, I invite you and I encourage you to radically trust yourself in situations, because something in you knows 
more than these coping strategies in your reality. So I hope that this was helpful for you. And if it was and anything stood out, make sure to leave a like and leave some love in the comments. I always love hearing from you guys. And if you want to stay in touch and get notified as I share more, make sure to subscribe. Lots of love, guys. Lots of love on your healing path. I'm sending you so much love and healing. Bye for now.